Well, good day and welcome to the Employment Law Show. John Scholes, Lior Samfiru, once again, busy show today. Employment agreements, what you need to know during COVID-19. That seems to be a theme recently, but hey, you know what? It's what everyone's talking about, so we're going to get to that. And we'll get to some phone calls from our live radio show, which we've been doing for, dare I say, close to nine years. We're coming up on nine years anyway, Lior. We'll get to some of those, and we'll cherry pick the good ones and talk about those and some emails as well. Anytime during the show, we always put it up at the bottom, uh, some contact information, but I'll give it to you regardless. one 855 821-5900 and help at employmentlawyer.ca. I know we're going to get into the Pocket Employment Lawyer website too, but uh, all in good time, my friend. What's uh, what's happening with you? And, and nine years and everyone's staying at home right now, but they look so young. Oh, sure. Uh, well, maybe you do. You know. <laughs> well, I, I'm excited to be back here and talking about employment law and workplace rights. And my gosh, over the past uh, six, seven, eight months, uh, with COVID-19, how many issues, how many questions have arisen, things that we may have ne never even thought of before. And a lot of people that have had secure jobs, that never had a workplace issue, are finding now that their job is not as secure, they're not working, or their job is changing, or maybe they're out of a job. But here's the thing, employment laws are still here. Employment laws have not gone anywhere. And I've said this before, and, and it's true now more than ever, we have great employment laws in this country. Pretty much anywhere you look in Canada, employment laws are good. They protect you, they give you rights. You may not know what those rights are. Well, that's why we're here. That's why we have the show, to tell you what those rights are, to answer questions, to help you infor be informed about what you are owed, what the law says you should have. So if you want to find out more about your rights, we'll, we're here every week to talk about that or you can always just reach out to me at the office. We'll have a private discussion. We'll give you that contact information throughout the show. But as John said, I always like to start off with some, uh, something that came across my desk. I spoke with a lady uh, earlier this week. She had been recalled back from a layoff, from a, a COVID-19 temporary layoff. Now, there were 10 employees that were put on layoff. Only three of them were uh, called back to work. She was one of the three. The other seven uh, are still off on a, on a layoff. But because now there's only three employees instead of 10, these three have to do a lot, and I do mean a lot more work. So this lady told me that she's working extremely long hours now. She's trying to keep up. She can't. She has a, a task list as long as her arm, trying to get things done she's never done before. She told me that the job that she had doesn't have any resemblance to the job she's currently doing because she's doing the job of at least two people, maybe even two and a half people in this situation. And at her wit's end, she called me and she asked me, Lior, what do I do here? Because I'm going to have to quit. I just can't do this anymore. So here's the thing, John. We talked before about the fact that an employer does not have a right to change the terms of your employment. That's a fact. So that you can't be demoted, you can't have your pay reduced, your hours changed, etc. But you also can't have your job changed by giving you that many more responsibilities. If you had a certain job and now your job is very different because they're expecting you to do double the work, that alone is illegal. That's a change to the terms of your employment, and you have a right to treat that as a constructive dismissal. And that's what I told this lady. You can obviously continue working, but then this is your new role, and you may be stuck in it forever, or you could treat that as a termination and leave with your severance. The nice thing for this lady is she was thinking now about leaving anyway because she couldn't do it anymore. She just couldn't, couldn't handle all these added responsibilities. So what I told her is, yes, you leaving is actually not going to be a resignation. It's a termination. It's a constructive dismissal and you're owed severance. Same for you. If your job has changed, the job that you had before, if it's no longer looking like the job you have now, you may be able to treat that as a termination. Whether it's COVID-19 related or not, you can treat that as a termination and get your severance. You know, the, the interesting thing you said there was, you know, she may have this job now forever. Now, does that mean now if she doesn't stand up and do something about this, this will become an implied term of her employment? Meaning that the employer says, well, you've been doing it for two years now. Now you're not going back. Absolutely. Yeah. So not only is, is she now going to be in this role forever unless she does something, and that could be her new responsibility, and she's now essentially doing two jobs forever, but by allowing her employer to change the job, they could change it again. And maybe in two months, they'll add more responsibilities and more until she literally cannot physically do it because she let them do it that first time. So it's never a good idea to open that door a crack because if you open that door a little bit, it can be pushed wide open and then you would be giving up your rights. If you're facing a change, your job is different, your hours, your pay, your compensation, location, any of that is different. 
Give me a call. Let's talk about that. Let's at least explore the issue of constructive dismissal. As you may, uh, may well know, we've been doing a radio show for years. We love doing it across the country, and we get a ton of phone calls every week. We try to answer as many as we can within that hour. And we pick a few to put on the show here on TV and talk about them. Our first show for today, or at least our first phone call, rather, for today is coming up right now. My daughter's going through this. She's been there 15 years. Unfortunately, for no fault of her own, the last couple of years she's been off on a LTD. They're saying that uh, we want the latest updated medical from you. If your medical comes back and says, doesn't look like you'll be returning to work for a while, they will fire you immediately. They've already laid out their severance. They're only offering the minimum ESA, which is one week per year, and they're offering 15 weeks. So there's a number of things to discuss there, and, and that is this. The only time a company can let an employee go while on disability without having to pay them their full severance is if it's a situation we refer to as a frustration of contract. Frustration of contract happens if you've been off for a very long time for medical reasons, number one, and number two, there's no likelihood of going back or being able to go back to work. So in this person, uh, his daughter seems like she has been off, he said, for a few years, so she meets that first condition. The second issue is, is it likely that she can go back to work? Now, that's an answer or, or a question that only her doctor can answer. So talk to your doctor. That's what I would say. If your doctor gives you a note saying, yes, you're working on getting better, you're working on getting back to work, you cannot be terminated. You can, certainly cannot be terminated with just 15 weeks pay. That's number one. If, number two, though, if your doctor says, no, we still don't think you'll be able to go back to work, then at that point, it is a frustration of contract, and the employer would only have to pay her her minimum termination entitlements. Now, why do we care? The, the difference between minimum entitlements and full entitlements is that after 15 years, her full termination entitlements can be significantly higher. So let's go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Let's plug that information in and see how much you would actually be owed her full termination entitlements after 15 years. So let's say she's in a clerical role for 15 years of service. I picked an age. Let's say she's in her 40s. Uh, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca correctly assesses her as being owed as much as 15 months pay. 15 months pay. That's the difference. So it could be the difference between 15 weeks, if it's a frustration of contract, and 15 months pay, her full termination entitlements. So same for you as well. If you're home, if you're on a disability leave, if your employer decides to let you go, if there is a likelihood of being able to come back to work, they cannot avoid paying you your full severance, keeping in mind, of course, that there also could, there also could be human rights issues if you're let go while on disability. That's why it's so important to reach out. Let's have a chat if you are let go. You know, you, you said it's really important, Lior, and just to take it outside the box, and I'll preface this by saying that when we're not doing this show, we do the disability law show with your partner, Savan. And I've learned this, that the... The, the reason they want to work with you guys is because in this particular case when there's LTD involved, long-term disability and severance, you got to know how to navigate that because there could be credits for one another and you could be losing money in essence because you're on LTD and you get a severance, correct? Right, You got to know yeah. how to deal with that. Absolutely. Your, your insurance company may say, well, wait a second, if you're getting severance, we're not going to pay you. Right. Or your employer may say, if you're getting disability benefits, we don't have to pay you as much severance. So you need to be able to navigate those things so that we can get everything you're owed from your employer and from your insurance company. So you're right, we do both and that's, it helps our clients tremendously because we know how to deal with the insurance company and the disability side and we sure know how to deal with employers on the employment side. So definitely important to reach out to us in those situations. Another way for you to reach out anytime, terminationquestions.com. You can go to that website, ask your questions, get it answered thoroughly and quickly. First one for today, Lior comes from Muhammad. He says, my boss scheduled an unexpected performance review for next week. Despite the fact that I've, uh, I've had a few years of glowing reviews, I know that a few other employees of the company were let go last month under similar circumstances. Could they let me go? So the answer always, but well, let's take a step back. I, often get this question asked is, can my employer let me go? And the answer always is yes. Your employer can let you go. It's a question of what do they owe you as a result of letting you go? In other words, how much severance is owed to you? So for Muhammad, can his employer say, yes, your performance was not good, so we're letting you go? They can do that, even if his performance was good, but they would have to pay him his full severance. Now, 
The only time the employer can avoid paying severance is if Muhammad did something terrible. If essentially his employer is saying it, it can show that he was deliberately doing a bad job. In other words, he was sabotaging the company. Yeah, if he's sabotaging the company, yeah, they could likely let him go without severance. But even if his performance is not great, that does not mean you can be let go without severance, also known as being let go for cause, not even close. And certainly, after the years that he's been there, he would be owed significant amount of severance. So that's why I often talk about severance on the show. It's not because I find it interesting and that's what I like to talk about. It's because the law deals in severance. You cannot prevent an employer from letting you go even if you've done nothing wrong. What you can do is get the severance that you're owed. And for most people, it's a heck of a lot more than a week's pay per year of service or two weeks pay per year of service. It could be months per year of service. So important, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca to find out what you're owed, reach out to me, and that's a good start po starting point. We are going to discuss employment agreements during COVID-19 after a short break, so stick around for that. Lots more of the Employment Law Show is on the way. You lost your job. They only gave you two weeks of severance per year worked. But where can you find out what you're really owed? I'm going to severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you're owed right now. Severancepaycalculator.com. You've been denied long-term disability. You think you're powerless, but you have a lot more power than you think. I'll tell you a secret. It's a numbers game for the insurance company. They're betting on you walking away from money that they owe you. Don't make that mistake. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900, or go to disabilityrights.ca. You lost your job. They said they had a good reason, but you think you've been wrongfully dismissed. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back, Employment Law Show, reaching out to Lior and his very capable team. Anytime, it's 1-855-821-5900, help at employmentlawyer.ca. Want to talk about this, and that is employment agreements during COVID-19. Taking it back to Employment Law 101, Lior, first of all, what is an employment agreement and why is it so important? <laughs> Well, an employment agreement is the document that governs the terms of your employment. It's a document that outlines what your rights and obligations are on your job. Now, remember, we spend most of our life at work. We spend more time at work than we spend at home with our family. We spend more time at work than we do anything else. Well, the employment agreement then is the document that governs our rights in employment. It's the document that governs our rights in the thing that we do the most. That's why it's so important. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and if you haven't watched our shows before, you're going to be surprised by what I'm about to say, and that is for the employee, having a written employment agreement is a bad thing. In fact, it's a terrible thing. A written employment agreement benefits the employer, full stop. A written employment agreement often is used by employers to limit rights that an employee has or even take them away completely. Remember, the law provides for rights that you have. They're automatic, automatically there. But what an employment agreement often does is take away some of those rights that otherwise would be there. So for an employee, you don't want to have an employment agreement. And having an employment agreement that's not favorable can cost you at some point tens of thousands of dollars, can give you less job security, and, and can be a, a huge, huge problem. So if you are asked to sign an employment agreement, if you're looking at an employment agreement, if you're not sure what it says, before you just put your John Hancock on the dotted line there, let's talk about that. Let me look at it and tell you what it really means. Yeah, you know, it's, it's weird because most people, our viewers, our listeners, our radio show are thinking, man, that makes me nervous not having something in writing. You know, I always want a contract, whether I'm leasing a car or a mortgage or divorce. But in this case, you want a handshake. You don't want a written contract. So does that verbal contract hold as much weight as a written contract? Well, I, I know it sounds strange for a lawyer like myself to say, no, no, you don't <laughs> want to have a contract. But when it comes to employment, you are better off having that handshake deal or you're better off having something on the back of a napkin or an email 
Okay, that's much better than a 10-page document with a lot of legalese that is going to be hugely problematic for you at some point. So having an oral employment agreement is perfectly fine. As long as you know what your job, are, what your job is, what your pay is, and how much vacation you have, frankly, for the employee, that's all you need to know. Uh, now, if you can get a few more terms, great. But you don't want to have a, a full, robust employment agreement. Now, if I stand over there and put my employer hat on, I would say the opposite. I would say for employers, it's that much more important. It's extremely important, in fact, to have written employment agreements because it can give you protections and rights as the employer that you wouldn't otherwise have. So depending on your perspective for an employee, oral agreement, perfect, all you need. For an employer, you want to have that full, robust employment agreement. If you have a termination clause in your agreement, can that impact your severance? So that is one of the things that an employment agreement can do. Right. Limit your future severance. So oftentimes what employers do is have a term in the employment agreement that says, employee, if we ever let you go down the road at some point, we're going to limit your severance. We're only going to give you a small portion of what you're owed. Now that could mean the, be the difference between getting 24 months pay severance and getting eight weeks pay severance. That's massive. It could be tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars difference. So that's what it can do. So you have to be very careful. As a general rule of thumb, if your employment agreement addresses the issue of termination, if it deals with the issue of termination, that's bad news. It tries to limit your entitlements. That's not true in every case, but it's true in almost every uh, case, almost every case. Now, there have been some recent court decisions, thankfully, for employees that limit the employer's ability to rely on a termination clause that essentially make it more difficult for employers to limit someone's severance. So it, just because you signed an employment agreement that tries to limit your severance, it doesn't mean that it actually does that correctly and effectively. So give me a call so we can always discuss it, but as a general rule, be very careful limiting your own severance. We're hitting the main points when it comes to employment agreements because of the whole COVID-19 situation. So this stuff is, is even more important than ever. If an employer comes to you, a current employer, asking you to sign an employment agreement, do you have to and how does that affect you? So this is where kind of COVID-19 comes into play right. here. And I've been getting many calls, many emails uh, recently employ from employees saying, well, I'm being called back to work after a layoff, but my employer wants me to sign a new employment agreement. Bad news, okay? There's no reason in this world why you should have to sign a new employment agreement. You're already working, you already have a job. The only reason your employer would ask you to sign that new, new employment agreement is to limit entitlements, like limiting your future severance or giving you the company the ability to change your job, to reduce your hours, to reduce your pay. So no, not something you want to do. You're absolutely allowed to say to your employer, no, I'm not going to sign this employment agreement. I already have an agreement with you, whether it's a verbal agreement or a written agreement. So no, I'm not going to sign it. You cannot be punished, penalized, uh, fired for cause for refusing to sign a new employment agreement. And if you do have one and you're not sure what it does, is it really a problem or is it not? Send me a copy. Shoot me an email with that agreement. Let me take a look at it and I'll tell you exactly what it says and what it does. I know you've had this phone call before, both uh, you know, in the office and on our radio show. Someone saying, you know, I've already been working there for a while. I never signed an agreement. Should I ask for one? Uh, consider yourself lucky if you didn't, because uh, as I said before, now because you didn't sign it, you have the full employment law rights at your disposal. Okay, all employment rights continue to apply to you because you didn't limit your entitlements. So please, please don't do this. If you don't have a written employment agreement, do not go knocking on your employer's door and say, oh, I want to sign one. No, you may find yourself giving up rights. I've seen that happen. I had situations where an employee insisted after they started working to get an employment agreement. Please don't do that. Consider yourself fortunate. You are better off with that handshake deal you have and you do not want to sign an employment agreement. So if someone is uh, looking at starting a new job, it's on the horizon. What should they do first before they sign that agreement if it's being slid over to them? Well, obviously, you need to understand what you're signing, okay? And most people, I find, and, and John, I think you and I have talked about this before, is that most people, when they get that employment agreement, are going to skim it quickly, scan it quickly, I should say, and they look at it, wait a second, okay, salary looks okay, vacation, vacation. looks okay, uh, I get the 10% bonus, looks good, I'm signing. 
fine, I understand why you would look at that, I would as well. But there are other terms in the agreement that you have to watch out for. Does it allow the company to change your job? That is, that, uh, does it allow the company to change your compensation? Does it limit your severance? Do they give them the right to lay you off temporarily? Is there a non-competition clause? Now, think about it this way. You may be very concerned about your salary and your job description. But let's say the salary and the job description are fine. They may also be a term in there that says, we have a right to change your job and change your salary. So essentially what you're right. saying to your employer is you can hire me for any role you want and pay me whatever you want. That's what you're signing. So be very careful with that. And the good news is that if you are looking at an employment agreement and if it's not favorable, oftentimes those terms can be negotiated. It's not doesn't mean you're, you're, you have to sign it. Oftentimes, and I can explain to you how to best go about doing that, it can be negotiated so that you end up signing a document that's a lot more reasonable. Head over to employmentlawyer.ca if you want to catch a station where you can find one of our radio shows across the country. You can do it there. We pull the phone calls from the show. And as you know, we talk about them here as well. Phone call number two is right now. I was promoted to a high volume, higher volume store than what I'm in. I'm in retail. And because of what's going on, they changed the structure of this particular store. So it's a much higher volume. Uh, I did receive an increase for this change, but now they are sending me back to the lower volume store. So I'm just wondering if they're able to take away the increase or if I'm still entitled to that. So this ultimately is a pay cut it doesn't matter how we get there you move to a store that makes less money so you're earning less money whichever way you look at it ultimately she's going to be making less money and as i said right at the beginning of the show your employer does not have a right to change your compensation or really to make any other significant changes to the terms of employment so yes if your employer now puts you in a position where you're going to be earning less money maybe they're giving you uh, a, a target a, a sales target that that's going to mean you make less money or a quota or an area where you're not going to be making as much money as you were making before, that is the same as them just slashing your pay, meaning you can treat that as a constructive dismissal. So what I would uh, say to this lady is talk to your employer, number one. To explain to them why ultimately you will be making less money, why you're not comfortable with that, why you think that's inappropriate. If your employer says, too bad, we're not going to change it, we're moving you, you're going to make less money, it is what it is, yeah. then you have a choice to make. You can accept and continue working, you're making less money with all that comes with that, or you can treat that as a constructive dismissal and leave with your severance. So whichever way you slice it, any way that results in you making less money, it is most likely a constructive dismissal. A freelancer let go without severance. We will tackle that after a short break. 1-855-821-5900. The email is help at employmentlawyer.ca. It's the Employment Law Show. Still more to come. Hang on. You were being harassed, and when you said something about it, you're the one who lost your job. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Insurance companies deny long-term disability claims all the time. They give lots of excuses. Don't give up. I've seen it all. They've ignored your doctors. They've ignored you. You're angry and you're frustrated. But there's hope. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900 or go to disabilityrights.ca. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back, Employment Law Show. Lots to go here. We'll get into another phone call pulled from our long-running radio show. We'll get to it right now. I have been working on a freelance basis for a company for a very long time over 25 years. If they decide not to use me anymore, do I have any recourse? It's on Good a question. freelance basis, but they consider me staff. I have a company email, I have company business cards. In a normal situation, how many hours a week would you work? About 25. Do you work for anyone else? I do have other freelance clients as well, yes. And is it fair to say that this particular company is your biggest one? Of course. 
Well, John, this is a, a clear and an obvious situation of misclassification. When, you know, saying someone is freelance is another way of saying that they're an independent contractor, which always brings up the issue of are you truly and correctly uh, being classified as an independent contractor. Most people that are, that are classified as independent contractors, that's incorrect. They're, they are something else. They're likely employees in the eyes of the law. Now, this person is likely an employee. She's worked there for 25 years. She's considered staff. She has business cards, email. I don't know how more of an employee she could be. She is likely an employee. It doesn't matter what she calls herself, freelancer, it doesn't matter what the company calls her. If she has a job, a regular job, if she's in involved with the business of her company, she's not doing her own business, she's really part of the company's business, then guess what? She is an employee, and she's likely been an employee for 25 years. Now, why is that important? It's important for many reasons. Number one is if you're an employee, you would be owed vacation pay and overtime pay and holiday pay. But if you're an employee, you're also going to be owed severance. Now, on pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, we have a tool that allows you to find out if you are an employee or an independent contractor. So if you're not sure what you are, if you're not sure if you've been misclassified, you probably have. But if you're not sure, go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca and use our tool to determine if you're an employee or a contractor. But I said that one of the reasons why it's important is the issue of severance. So if this person truly is an employee, like I've just said, what how, or how much severance would she be owed? So let's plug our information into pocketemploymentlawyer.ca and let's find out. So She's been there for uh, 25 years. I picked an age. Let's say she's in her 50s. Someone in her situation could get as much as 22 months pay, anywhere from 18 to 22 months of severance. Depending on her compensation, that could be, well, that could be a lot of money. Let's put it that way. And the reason I'm showing you this is because if she really was an independent contractor, that severance amount may be zero. She may not be owed anything. But because she's been misclassified, because she is likely an employee, she could be owed as much as 22 months pay. Same for you. If you lost your job, but you've been misclassified as an independent contractor, when you're not really that, you're going to be owed your full severance. Reach out to me. Go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca to have your matter evaluated, free, anonymous, takes seconds. Very important tool. We'll wrap up today with uh, one more question from terminationquestions.com. You can go there and lay your question down any time and to get answered. Uh, this one from Enid says, My father's employer told him that they may need to let him go permanently due to COVID-19 and that if they do, they are not required to pay him severance. He's been with them for 27 years. Are they correct? I've heard this so often, more often than I should. Companies saying, well, it's because of COVID-19 that we're letting you go. And because it's COVID-19, we don't have to pay you severance nonsense, wrong, illegal. If you lose your job, even if it's because of COVID-19, even if the company is legitimately struggling financially, severance laws still apply. You don't get to decide, the company doesn't get to decide if they're going to comply with the law. They have to. It's the cost of having a business in the country, in this province. So after 27 years, he probably is owed two years pay, two years pay, which is generally the maximum that anyone is entitled to get. So I've seen this often. He's owed two years pay. If you lost your job right now, if the company's saying, oh, it's COVID-19 related, my gosh, it's, a, it's an act of God, so we don't have to pay you any severance. No, that is incorrect. Company has to pay you severance. Go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, reach out to me. Let's get you everything that you're owed because it may take you longer to find another job. Well, like you've said, uh, you know, employment laws are not on temporary layoff. They're still robust and still out there, so make sure you, uh, you use them for sure. You want to reach out now that we're done for the day? No problem. 1-855-821-5900 would be the phone number. The email address we use is help at employmentlawyer.ca. And for all the other matters, you can go to employmentlawyer.ca as well. You'll catch links to our long-running radio show as well. We'll catch you next time. Employment Law Show. Thanks for tuning in. Closed captioning of this program is brought to you in part by severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you are owed right now. severancepaycalculator.com.